after next week, um, I want to uh, start covering the uh, processing programming language. And I want to show you where to go to download that if you haven't already done that. Uh, and then I'll get talking into a little bit more about uh, some Excel issues. So let me uh, share my screen. Here. Okay. And uh, pivot tables. I want to talk a little bit about this today, but let me go. This is one of the videos uh, I had set up for you to view. Let's see. Processing.org is what I'm typing in here. And it's a website where they have a bunch of tutorials and examples uh, and a lot, a lot of information about the processing programming language. Uh, processing is a programming language that was originally developed by people at MIT and it's designed for uh, graphic artists and people doing multimedia. And it's, uh, it's a modified version of the Java programming language. Uh, and if you know Java, you might see the relationship, and if you don't, there's you, you're not losing any anything. I'm going to go through this step by step and how to use it. And you see right here, there's download processing. And the IT people there at UCA have assured me that you are able to do this. And you download, so I'm assuming you're working with Windows, Windows 32-bit, click here and then um, download it. I'm, I'm not downloading Windows because I'm using a Mac. And uh, download it and run the installer. Hopefully you won't have any problems. If you're having problems, we need to contact IT to see if they can help with this. Uh, and then, uh, after we're done here with the Excel, I'm going to start going through processing and show you step by step how to build up and do things in processing. And uh, OK, so that's a really important thing. You need to be able to get processing loaded and running on your laptops. OK, now let's see what should I do next here. Um, I'm going to do pivot tables in Excel. Now, I'm going to confess here, I have never used pivot tables for the kinds of things that I use Excel for. Uh, pivot tables have not been uh, necessary. Uh, but people who do use pivot tables tell me that they're possibly the most useful aspect of doing things in Excel. Like I mentioned to you, my wife is an engineer. She works for Siemens, Siemens Energy in particular. And uh, she uses pivot tables all the time. And in fact, she spends most of every day working using Excel and uh, possibly uh, then the pivot tables from what she tells me. Uh, so I thought I would cover pivot tables because as I reviewed exactly what pivot tables do, it seemed to me that that many of you, um, if or when you start using Excel, you might find pivot tables useful also. But like I said, I've never used pivot tables. So rather than have me talk about pivot tables, which is something I haven't used, I went online and I found a, some some good tutorial videos. So thought I might 
pull one or two of those up today. We can look at those uh, and uh, you can get some idea. But let me just tell you in advance that like most tutorials that you find online, you might have to look at it a few times before you kind of understand everything that they're talking about. It's my experience with online tutorial tutorials. Most of the time they go too fast. And so you watch something and you might have to stop it and then go back and watch it again. Stop it, go back and watch it again. And um, you probably have to do that with your online videos that you're getting right now at UCA. So uh, that's the way you need to watch these online videos. So let me pull up now. Um, here. Advanced Excel. Here we go. Here's the tutorial on pivot tables that I found that seems pretty good. Let me go back to the beginning here. OK, so I'll watch this. And um, but like watch it, there will be things that you won't really understand. You have to go back and rewatch and rewatch and rewatch. So in this tutorial, we're going to learn how to use pivot tables in Excel. And for some reason, pivot tables have this reputation as being kind of hard to use. And at first, it probably will seem that way to you. But after watching this video, I hope that you'll see them as being not too complicated to use. And for this tutorial, I've created a spreadsheet that is an inventory of synth pop CDs. Let's say that I own a CD store that sells exclusively the best kind of music ever made, which is synth pop. I don't have a store like that. Maybe I should, but I don't. But what I've done here is I've created this spreadsheet that lists some of the important information that I want to track for my hypothetical synth pop CD store. I have listed here several bands. Some of these no doubt you've heard of, like Depeche Mode or perhaps Erasure, OMD. But there's also some here that are a little bit lesser known, but I think are really excellent. Next, we have albums, and these are their most recent albums from these bands. These are albums that I've recently picked up myself and listened to and really enjoy. Next, we have a column for genre. It's all really synth pop, but for some reason, some of these get labeled as rock. For example, The Killers, and they do have a mix of rock and synth pop and new wave kind of blended all together. But anyway, we have the genre listed, an item number, which is more of an internal number just for my hypothetical store to use. We have the price of the CD, and this incidentally is the current actual price of the CD on Amazon. Next, we have the quarter. And so I'm tracking each quarter of the year and tracking how each of these CDs does during that quarter. Next, I have the number of copies sold for each album in each of these quarters. And then I have a formula here to calculate the total number of sales. In other words, the amount of money brought in. And it's a simple formula. Number of copies sold multiplied by the price. So this is a nice, useful spreadsheet to help me track my small business and what are the big money makers for my business. The problem is, with all of this data, it can be kind of hard for me to drill down and to really see certain information. Like, for example, how did I do in the first quarter altogether with all of these CDs? and their sales, how did my business do in the first quarter? Well, that's a little bit difficult. I would have to maybe copy, paste each of these first quarter sales numbers into another sheet or another part of this spreadsheet, and then I'd have to do a formula to calculate that number. Or another example, what if I wanted to know specifically how well did the dark wave music that I sold, how well did it do? Or what if I was selling more than just one CD by Depeche Mode? What if I was selling two different CDs or three different CDs by them? What if I wanted to calculate the total number of copies sold of Depeche Mode CDs, regardless of what the album is? Could I calculate that on my own? Yes, I could. I could create a report basically just by highlighting, copy, paste. But honestly, that could take quite some time to do. And it might be likely that I would make a mistake. And it's just a lot of work and effort. But fortunately, a pivot table can really help me in this situation. Just to give you a quick definition of a pivot table, 
A pivot table is an Excel tool that allows you to reorganize and summarize certain data in the spreadsheet and specifically in selected columns and rows of data. And it not only reorganizes and summarizes that data, but it produces a report, a report that is gonna be helpful to you. And one important thing to recognize about pivot tables is that they don't really change any of your data. When I create this pivot table in just a minute, it's not going to change the data in my spreadsheet. This is all going to stay intact. Nothing's gonna be changed at all. It just helps me to look at this data in a new way. So let's get started. Now, the first thing to consider when you're about to create a pivot table is that it's very important that your data be organized well. It really does need to be a list. You need to have columns with headings or titles. So that's what I have, band, album, genre, etc., and then a list of items. And as you can see, they can be repeated items, that's fine, but it needs to be a vertical list. Also, it's important that you not have any blank rows. Sometimes, for whatever reason, people end up with a blank row in their spreadsheet. And that's if you want to use a pivot table. So before you use the pivot table tool, make sure that your data is good, that there's no blanks in the data. So I'm going to delete that row to get it back into a condition that will work well. Also, you need to be careful about extra data. So for example, in this spreadsheet, what if I had over to the right side, just some notes written here, like maybe need to update. Maybe that's just a note to myself that I need to update these numbers. Or maybe I have down here the word total, and then I've put in a formula that adds everything up. Okay, you don't want to have extra data like that, either to the side or underneath your data. You need to have a nice data set that doesn't have any extra unnecessary information around it. Okay, so the next recommendation that I have before you use the pivot table tool, you don't have to do this, but I highly recommend it. And that is you need to format your data as a table. So to do that, all I have to do is click somewhere inside the data. So I'm going to click here on the word material. And then here on the home tab, home, the styles group, I'm going to click on format as table. I can pick any of these styles to format my data as a table. I'm going to go with this one. Then it wants me to double check that I'm getting all of the data for the table. And it looks pretty good to me, but you could change these numbers if you needed to. Yes, my table has headers. That's these column titles across the top. I'll click OK. And look, it formatted my data as a table. I like how that looks. So even though you don't have to do this when you're using pivot tables, it is a good idea to format your data as a table. And the reason why is because that way, now that it's a table, let's say I add another CD to my inventory. Okay, let's say Brandon Flowers, the desired effect. As I add in this information, notice that it's adding it directly to the table. It recognizes that it's part of this data set and it formats it along with the rest of the information. And not only that, but when you use the pivot table, the information in the pivot table will be updated when you add additional, in this case, CDs to the table. Okay, so let's create a pivot table for this table full of amazing CDs. To do this, all I have to do is go up to Insert and choose Pivot Table. And right away, Excel wants me to give it some information about the pivot table. And notice that the first thing it's asking is if the data is a table or a range, or if I would like to use an external data source. In this case, I want to use a table. It is a table, and it guessed that I wanted to use Table 3. And table 3. If it guessed wrong, you could pick a different one, but in this case, it worked well. It guessed the right table, most likely because that's where my mouse was. Next, I'm supposed to choose where I want the pivot table report to be placed, somewhere in this existing worksheet. If so, I'm gonna have to specify the location. For me, I almost always choose new worksheet. That way it just gives me another sheet and it puts the pivot table there on the sheet. It's just cleaner that way. Okay, so I'm ready to create the pivot table. I just click okay. And look, it created another sheet for me down here, and it gives me a little bit of instructions to build a report, choose fields from the pivot table field list. 
and that pivot table field list is over here at the right. You can see that a panel opened up on the right, and this is the pivot table fields panel or pane. And what we have here is a list of the column headings or column titles that I had typed in this original spreadsheet. So band, album, genre, etc. Band, album, genre. And then down below, I have these four areas, filters, columns, rows, and values. And what this is for is Excel is basically asking me in this pivot table report that I'm about to make, what do I want to be arranged in rows? What do I want to be arranged in columns? And what values do I care about in this report? And then finally, what filters, if any, do I want to apply to this report? So let's say I want to know which bands were my best sellers in the first quarter of the year. Well, the column for bands is going to be important. So I'm going to go up here and click on bands and I'll just drag that down and I'm going to put that in the rows box. As soon as I did that, look what happened. I got a list of all of the bands. Now, what data do I care about? Well, I want to know the total money brought in. So I click on sales and I drop it down in the values box down here. So now I can see for each band how much money was brought into my hypothetical small business. Now, maybe I decide, no, that's a mistake. I don't necessarily want to know the amount of money. I just want to know how many units I sold. So copies sold would be the one to drag down there. And now that changes my pivot table. It's showing me different information now. Honestly, though, I think I would rather see the sales. So I'm going to put that one back. But remember, in my example, I wasn't interested in the total sales. I was interested in the total sales for each band in the first quarter. So quarter is also important to me. And I'm going to drag quarter this time into the columns box. So now I can see each band and each quarter how much money was brought in for selling their CDs. Now, if I had dragged quarter down to rows instead of columns, what would that have looked like? I'm going to remove that field so that you can see. I'll drag it down to rows underneath band. And so now the data is still the same. It's just arranged differently on the screen. I have the first band here, black audio, and it's in a row, but I also put quarter in a row. So it listed the four quarters that are associated with black audio right underneath black audio. And so Excel is really smart about this. It figures out that these quarters in the original spreadsheet are obviously referring to quarters for black audio. And so it keeps that data together. And then Covenant, the sales quarters for Covenant are listed there, Depeche Mode, the Killers, on and on. So I just wanted you to see that, that the same data can be illustrated in different ways based on the box that you drag the column name into. All right, now the last box that we need to think about is filters. So I'm going to drag quarter down to filters as well. Now, as soon as I do that, look what happened. The column title quarter can't be in both of these boxes. And so it disappeared out of the columns box and it moved to the filters box. Also, look what it did to my data. It's no longer spread out by quarter, but that's OK. I have basically applied a filter here. Here at the top, it says quarter all. But if I click on this drop down arrow, instead of all, I could try selecting one. And now it shows the first quarter sales for each band. It looks like the Killers was the best selling band in first quarter for my hypothetical company. Their new album, Wonderful Wonderful, is pretty wonderful, I think, and uh, you should check it out if you haven't already. But anyway, I hope that you can see how useful this is. Now, of course, these pivot table reports can get pretty complicated. If I wanted to, I could include the album down here in the rows. I could include the genre in the filters so I can filter out, let's say, all of the music except for synth pop. OK, so that reduced it down dramatically. I could put price in the columns if I wanted to. And so you can really get some complicated pivot table reports going here. In a future tutorial, I'll show you another way to create pivot tables. And it's kind of a shortcut. A lot of people find it to be easier, but I do think it's important if you're going to use pivot tables to learn how to do it the right way, the old fashioned way, I guess, of manually selecting everything that you want and organizing your pivot table report the way you want it to be using this pivot table fields panel. So please watch for that future video. I hope that you found this video to be helpful. If you did, please click the like button below and consider connecting with me on my social media websites like Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. Okay, now let me uh, 
let me make it so you can see what the link is to that and, and in case you want to go and, and look at it you can see <clears throat> it could be confusing uh, so you know if you think you really want to use this I, I highly recommend practicing with it and um, let me uh, expand out that link so you can clearly see it here Well, that's not what I wanted here. I'm trying to. I think it's automatically connecting rather than giving me the words. That's unfortunate. Yeah, that's what it's doing. Darn, let me try putting it here and see what happens. There, OK, now. Let me go be even bigger here. OK, here's that link to that video, but I mean, you, you don't need to just look at that one video. Um, it's one I picked because I, I thought it was fairly well done, but there are a ton of pivot table videos. So here's the link. Right along here. And uh, so when you go back and look at this video, you can you can pause the video and then copy the link down. OK, now let me just close this. There. OK, so so much for pivot tables here. Now. Um, one of the things for today was the Fibonacci sequence. Let me just talk about that a little bit. And uh, Fibonacci is uh, an interesting uh, mathematical problem. It's been around for a long, long time. And it turns out to be related to uh, things that happen in nature as well as um, things like the golden ratio, which you may have heard about. And um, let me uh, let me expand the size. But this is purely an exercise to learn some things about Excel. Let's see, view, let me go over here to view, go to 200. OK, so I'm just going to quickly. This is discussed in one of the videos that I have online that is linked uh, in my syllabus. Let me just write out the Fibonacci uh, sequence here for you just so you can see how it goes. And um, usually the Fibonacci starts with a zero. And then a one, so I'll just type in zero and one there. Then right here, I put in the formula that this equals the sum of the previous two values. So it's this plus this, it return. So one plus zero is one. Now let me just drag this down. See, now it does one plus one is two, and then two plus one should be three right here. So you see how that works right there. OK, I just go down here a ways. You see the Fibonacci uh, increases in value quickly because every value is the sum of the two previous terms. OK, now what I what I want to do is put in this column. What I want to do is uh, right at this point, I want to take this value and divide it by this value. So I'm going to take um, whatever the value is in the row and divide it by the value in the previous row. 
So I could do that. Uh, I can't divide by zero, so I can't do that right up here with these two values. But right here, I can do one divided by one. So I'll put equals one divided by one there. So this then is that divided by that. Now let me drag this down. So I just have two divided by one is two. Here I'll do three divided by two, which is one and a half, and so on. So let me drag this down. Okay, now this isn't the, uh, these numbers are not the Fibonacci, these numbers are the Fibonacci values. These numbers, I'm just manipulating, taking two of the Fibonacci values and computing something. And right away, we notice something really fascinating, at least I think it's fascinating, and it probably tells you more about me than anything, and that if I take the two successive values in the Fibonacci table, like 13 divided by 8, I get 1.625. Then 21 divided by 13, I get this. Notice that these numbers converge into and they quickly converge into a constant value of 1.61. In fact, if I go down, let me let me just click, shift click, and keep dragging a ways here. So notice I quickly converge into this value and at least to this many decimal point digits, the value never changes, it stays the same. And this is to say that these sequence of numbers converge to a fixed value. Now, in my mind, that in itself is pretty interesting. And if I were teaching a more mathematical course or, or a hardcore computer science course, I might ask the students to figure out why this is the case. OK, but this is really, in my mind, it's really interesting because it, it it's interesting because it was a surprise. You don't expect the two successive values when you divide them to come into uh, a constant and stay there forever as you go down. Now, it turns out something even more interesting is this number that pops up is the golden ratio. So, we divide two successive terms in the Fibonacci sequence. It converges to a constant, and that constant is the golden ratio. OK, now, what would happen? Remember, I automatically began my Fibonacci with 0 and 1. Suppose I started with two other numbers. Suppose I started with 6 and 9. Those are two numbers. OK, obviously the Fibonacci numbers change. Because the two starting numbers change, but indeed I still converge to the golden ratio when I do the division of two successive numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. Another surprise. And so then I could say, OK, OK, yeah, great. But surely there are two numbers I can put in here where that doesn't happen. Let me, I have this number greater than that one. Let me switch. Let me make this number higher. Let me make this number 11 and this number 2. How's that? And indeed, I still converge to the golden ratio here. Oh, wow. This is really odd. So as I make, let me try making these two numbers negative, see what happens. Negative 8, negative 5. Okay, put two negative, now all the Fibonacci numbers are negative, and I still converge to the golden ratio. Well, let me make one negative and one positive. I mean, there's got to be some way I can mess this up. So let me make that five. Okay, clearly positive and negative. That's going to have to mess things up. 
wait a minute. It's still the golden ratio. So, like I said, I found this to be surprising, but then I'm the kind of person that finds this kind of stuff interesting. Um, it's interesting the way the ratio of a circumference to the diameter of a circle is always pi, no matter how big the circle is. You know, that's kind of what this kind of reminds me of. So we always get the golden ratio there. And no matter how we choose to pick these numbers, go back to zero and one. So that to me is one of the interesting things about the Fibonacci sequence. And um, you know, some of you might be uh, might be you know, sort of mathematically curious about this. Uh, somewhere in my online videos, I also talk about. I show you why we always end up with that ratio being the ratio of two successive numbers in the Fibonacci sequence coming out to be the golden ratio. And I prove to you why that's true. And again, uh, the proof I don't think is, uh, is it's not deep mathematics, but there's a little trick to it. And um, so you might want to look over some of my old videos and where I actually proved that. And um, I think that video actually has a lot of views. So apparently a fair number of people were interested in knowing how that works. So that's uh, just a little introduction into Fibonacci. We get, we always end up with the golden ratio, no matter which two numbers we seem to start with. And uh, like I said, the the Fibonacci sequence seems to have importance. It pops up over and over again in nature. And flowers, uh, turns out, Fibonacci pops up. In seashells, Fibonacci pops up. Keeps popping up in seemingly unrelated areas, like pi does. Pops up in unrelated areas. So it... Uh, it's perhaps a, a clue to a deeper level of how the universe works. I don't know, but it's interesting to me. Okay, um, now let me go back to what I was saying right in the beginning, I think before I even turned on the, the recording. Um, on this upcoming Sunday, I would like you as to turn in your projects. And I think there are still... There's also homeworks due too. And um, here we are. So week six, Fibonacci sequence. These are the videos to look at. Um, and then if we go down here to homeworks, week nine, week eight, week six, um, question about Fibonacci. Can you show why the limit of the function goes to the golden ratio? So I ask if you can do it. And um, the only way of doing that is to, for you, I, for most of you, I think, is to go look at that video. And even then, you might have some questions. So consider this as a request and not mandatory. Are there any cases when the values for Fn does not approach it, when the, this is the ratio of two, I'm calling it Fn, does not approach the golden ratio? I have not found a case, but I haven't looked very hard. So, um, you know, consider this, these questions here, you know, to you know, give them, think about them, see if you can come to any, any conclusion. Uh, week seven, I think I told you I'm not going to give a midterm, so I want to leave this for you. You can focus on your other courses. You don't have to worry about this course. So for next week, um, I may not even uh, do um, do any topics in the 
posted videos, but I may I'm still planning on coming on and coming online and you know seeing if people have any questions. Maybe you've tried to install processing and couldn't do it, something like that. Although I'm not sure how much I can help you since I'm using a Mac and you're using PCs. So, uh, but I'll still come on, but I'm not planning on doing anything next week so you can can work on your other courses that do have uh, midterms. For me, in this course, your project is your midterm. Okay, so I think that's everything that I have really to say today. And um, let me see, does anyone uh, have any questions about any of these topics or question about anything else? Uh, maybe I can answer the question, maybe not. Let me get off of my uh, screen sharing. OK, there you are, all you beautiful people here. And um, I suspect some people come on, log online, and uh, then walk away from their laptop. I'm not offended. Sometimes I go to meetings and um, I walk away from my laptop too. Don't, don't tell anybody I said that. Uh, of course, it's harder to do if you have your camera on. So if people turn their camera off and they're in, a, they're in a meeting and their camera's on, they turn their camera off. I think there's a high probability that they're just walking away. So, okay, so. I haven't heard anybody come on with any, any questions here. OK. Um, good afternoon. So should we submit our projects by Turnitin or just via email? Because um, no. yeah, don't do Turnitin. I mean, uh, uh, OK, you know, I, you know, I turn it in as for when you're writing term papers and and they want to make sure that you haven't um, copied your term paper from someplace else which happens um, interesting little thing um, I think most of you probably know of my daughter Mara maybe you haven't talked with her but um, she's uh, taking all of her courses online just like you guys. I think she's taking five courses this semester and um, she's working 11 hours a day on her courses and uh, I don't know if you're working that hard um, but she's working really hard. I mean I'm I'm really proud of how hard she works. So I'm proud of my daughter. I, you know I'm a father so let me let me be that way. And um, in, in her biology course, which involves a lot of memorizing, biology requires a lot of memorizing. It's different than chemistry or physics, which requires a lot of mathematical analysis and manipulation. Her biology course just requires, she memorizes all of these terms, and most of which are sort of derived from Latin and, uh, and Latin you know, people in biology and medicine use Latin and uh, so she has all this memorization to do and she's taking these courses online and uh, and she has quizzes every week um, and she uh, she's figured out the easiest way to memorize things, which is you do your memorization just before you go to sleep, just by the way our brain works. The biology of our brain means if we study things just before we go to sleep, we remember them much better uh, going forward. 
I learned this when I was a student, although I, I didn't understand the biology of the brain, but when I was a student and I'd be studying, I recognize, you know, there are some people that did all nighters, as we call them. You know, they would study all night before an, a test or quiz or an exam, and they would brag about it. What I discovered is if I started studying late at night, I'd have to study four times longer to memorize something than I would earlier in the day. In other words, after about 11 p.m., my studying efficiency plummeted. And so I figured that studying late at night was a waste of time. So I wouldn't study past 11. I would go to sleep and then try to get up early in the morning and start studying again. And that worked much better for me. And what I discovered is that when I stopped studying and went to sleep, when I woke up in the morning, I remembered everything that I had been studying. So I kind of learned through trial and error that studying just before you go to sleep, if you're memorizing just before you go to sleep, that's the best way to learn. So I never, ever pulled an all-nighter. All my years in school, I never, I, I went into this strategy where 11 o'clock I would quit, I would go to sleep, and I would get up early, maybe, you know, maybe six, I'd get up early and then start studying again. And that did things much better for, made me learn much faster and easier. And Mara also studied um, neuroscience. And I guess the neuroscientists had, since I, when I was young and now she's young, in that period, neuroscientists discovered that, in fact, studying just before you go to sleep, by the way our brain works, and our, what our brain does is it processes everything that we did during the day after we go to sleep. And so it actually forms the memory after we go to sleep. And so the neuroscientists discovered that studying just before you go to sleep is the way to remember things. So that's the way she studies. But most of the students in her class never learned that about the brain, how the brain works and how it's easier to remember things that way. So that's the way Mara studies. She's got pages and pages and pages of, of information about species and about what species are related to other species and all these Latin terms and typical members of species. And she's got you know, a huge amount of information to study and memorize in biology. And um, so she studies, I don't know, for about hour or hour and a half, she studies her biology just before she goes to sleep. And she does extremely well. And her classmates who study more hours but don't study before they go to sleep, they might pull an all-nighter before a test, and they're crapping out. So she's doing these tests online. That's where I started this conversation. She's doing her tests online. And um, because there is so much to memorize and learn in this biology course, um, uh, even though online she would uh, have to go in and do a lockdown browser, I don't know if you know what that is, it's a browser that prevents you from, let's say, going in and Googling things to find out the answers to questions. And um, so they would have to go into a lockdown browser and have to do their biology quizzes. So what they started doing was cheating by putting you know, pages of everything they had to study. They'd lay it out on their desk or whatever. And, um, and they were cheating. And um, so the professor started requiring them to, uh, in addition to being able to, to record their camera from their laptop, so they would, 
while they were doing the test, the video would be recorded. So that way somebody could go back and look at the video and see if you look like you were cheating by looking down at things. And the professor wanted them also to take their phones and set up their phones so their phones are recording them from behind while their laptop video is recording them from up front. So, you know, it's really becoming, I think, excessive, you know, with all these cameras on you while you're doing these online tests. And anyway, one student in her class cheated, figured out how to set up her stuff so that she could still cheat. And then she made a terrible mistake. She bragged about it to the other students. And then the other students told the professor. And um, I, my understanding, and I don't know this for an absolute fact, but I think the professor failed her in the course. Um, she was, and I think the professor had said, if she caught anybody doing that, that's exactly what she would do. And if that's what she said she would do, she probably did it more so as a lesson to the other students. I actually, my personal opinion is I think that's probably a bit excessive, but that's what she did. And uh, it's usually the professor's choice and how they're going to deal with this. I eliminate the cheating problem by not calling anything cheating. I want you to learn. And, and if you learn by going online and, and looking at things, however you, you learn, is I want you to learn the material. So um, I used to be um, more demanding when I was younger as far as making my tests very challenging and being very, very um, mean when it came to things like cheating. But over my 45 years of teaching, I kind of learned that it really doesn't make any difference. It doesn't help students learn any better by doing that. But I think it appears to take professors a while to come to that understanding and to realize that. And what I found is that people learn things if they're interested in them, they learn them. If you're not interested in something, no matter how much you work, you're likely not going to learn it very well. I hope some of you are interested in what we're doing in Excel, only because Excel is actually quite useful for you. No matter what you do down the road, knowing how to use Excel can be really useful. But like anything, you learn by practicing. So that's my little speech for today. And uh, I, uh, you do have some homework due this week in addition to your project. So this week it might be a little bit more demanding, but next week I'm going to let you work on your other courses where you may be doing some midterms. So I'll let you work on that next week. Then after that, we're going to pick up and do processing, which is really different than Excel. So uh, so that's where we're going with this. Processing is sort of more traditional computer programming. But in processing, we'll be doing more graphics and things like that, which is pretty easy to do in processing. So, OK, I'm done. Um, and. Um, so have a good uh, week, everyone. Uh, don't get sick. I'm trying to avoid getting sick. That's for sure. Um, and uh, so that's it. Um, hello, Thank you. Sam. Have a nice day. Too. Yeah, somebody have a question? A question, yes. Um, so for the... A COVID uh, project I wanted to take about 10 countries or a, a little bit more. Do you have any uh, limits of choosing countries, like number of countries? No, no, no. I'm, I'm kind of leaving this project 
up to mm-hmm. you is to set your own limits. Um, as you may mm-hmm. learn as you go out to work, uh, when you go out to work and your boss, your supervisor asks you to do something, usually they don't specify every last detail. I don't know, maybe in Kyrgyzstan or maybe in ex-Soviet countries, they specify every detail. My experience is you're allowed to make a lot of your own choices. And so I want to let you make your own choices on what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, how many countries you're going to pick. And Mm -hmm. uh, so the answer to your question is do what you want to do. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, guys. Now. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. I'll try. You Thank t- you. Yeah. End meeting. Stop recording. Here we go.